Hi, this is Ryan Fraser. This is Troy Daney. This is Gus Boyet. This is Don Hutchison. This is Jürgen Klopp, and you're listening to The Big Interview with Graham Hunter. Thank you, Jürgen. I travel to all these interviews from Barcelona, and our socios, our beloved members, keep us on the road. This independent podcast wouldn't happen without them. Please go to patreon.com forward slash Graham Hunter right now to join us, to become a socio, and to get every interview we produce without adverts and before it goes out on the main feed, plus lots of bonus content, including the chance to put questions to our guests and to me via the monthly Q&A. So do please go to patreon.com forward slash Graham Hunter and join the club and get your family and friends to do so. Maybe even strangers in the street. Love you. Welcome to our Big Interview Icons series, where we shine a light on a legend whose name has lit up some of the conversations I've had with our guests over the years. This episode focuses on José Mourinho. Benny McCarthy's extremely tough time at Celta Vigo ended when José brought him to Porto. Benny saw the Portuguese as something of a father figure, and together they won the Champions League with Porto in 2004. Meanwhile, Line of Duty star Martin Comston was struck by Mourinho's will to win, even in a high-profile charity match. While the mighty Robert Huth remembers that when Mourinho arrived at Chelsea, he took training sessions to a completely new level. The special one introduced an intensity plus an attention to detail, which fired players' imaginations. Jose Mourinho, icon. Now, you won't hear me saying that very often, so make the most of it. Porto in that stage weren't Champions League. When you went down, Mourinho was taking over because they were having, for them, the difficulties. Eh? Yeah, they were having the worst season. I think there were six, six in the league and a uh, long time that Porto's been there. And then obviously, so I played in um, the cup match, which they won four, and I scored two, I think, on my on on my debut, and in, and one assist. So yeah, everybody was like, "Oh, great signing! Like now we've got a striker." And then the coach got the boot, and then he was out the door. And then the next day on training, I saw, hey. That's the guy that It's that to, guy. The, the, like the young guy that spoke to me, that convinced me to come to Porto. <laughs> Meanwhile, he was the, that was going to be the coach. And he's like, oh, it's like, I'm glad you took my advice and happy to, happy to have you here, you know. And I said, I said nah, with you in my team, what I want to do, I'm going to win everything. And I'm thinking to myself... <laughs> Is this guy on drugs? Or <laughs> what is he? Because I, I couldn't even catch a game at Celta. And he's telling me that he's going to win everything because now he's the missing link in his puzzle. You know? I couldn't understand it, what he was on about. But anyway, I just said, OK, OK, yeah, I'm glad. And I'm going to do my best for him, you know? And I think the thing that just made me switch and I said I, I, I'm, I'll run through a brick wall for this guy was he did something that nobody in football has ever done like football manager wise coach never came and understood what you were going through your mm-hmm. pain or that everybody just thinks oh like you're getting paid big money so you just get on with it you're but just kind of like a servant you're not yeah, a person but people people didn't understand people didn't know what i was going through and the the tough time that i had at salta and then came and he said hey you're okay and, you know i'm happy to be there and he says oh if you need anything you know like just ask if you want to come for dinner my house is open wow. And he gave me a hug, like he hugged me, and he says, "Ah, listen, he's here for me, and what everything." And and I, I felt like I wanted to cry, but I couldn't because the situation wasn't a suitable situation for me to cry now. And 
People's like, oh yeah, the, the, the manager's son now, and look, that's why he's playing every week because you understand. So I, I kept it together, but when I went back, and I was like, I was like, wow, he's he's not just like a coach; he's he's a human being, like yeah. he cares, and he probably knows my shit that I was going through at Salta, and that's why he's the way he is. You know, like he was just very caring, and and I think that was a nice touch because. I've never had it. Do you know, Benny, I, I don't know him so well, but he tells a story about how as a kid, his dad's a football coach. And the club his dad is working for sacks him, I think on Christmas Eve or even Christmas Day. And of course that brings misery to the house, to the family, at a time of great joy. And the young Mourinho, according to Jose himself as he retells it, says there, there and then, okay, uh, this is how football is, I don't like this. And, and whether it's the same now, because all men change, they grow, they mutate. But at that point, the guy you're describing who, uh, because many people listening might be surprised that a human touch is unusual in football. Now, maybe we know it is, um, but it's amazing how much small things can do because... Friends who respect each other might do what you're talking about. How are you? Yeah. Can I help? Um, here's a good idea about what you might do now. So good people do that to each other all the time. But maybe not in football. And I remember when you first started telling me stories like this, you told me about him having a similar effect on the dressing room. Because the team talk about, if you do this, this is what will yeah. happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just try and bring that dressing room moment because he gave the same feeling to your teammates as he gave to you. If you do what I say, then we'll qualify for this. And then, because yeah, I think yeah. he also mm-hmm. correctly predicted what you would win. Yeah, no, 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 100%. So, yeah, and I, I think I, I paid off straight away because I played like a, like a man possessed, you know, and, and I don't think, yeah, I could. I was scoring. I was scoring goals before and that, but I was not playing at the level that I was that I played for Jose, where I did anywhere else. You know, people say, "Oh," and like I was scoring. No, not not just strikers' goals. Like goals from. Never going into midfield, go and get the ball, pop, one little one touches and heading 40 yard shots from from anywhere, top corner and like I was playing out of my skin. So I don't know if it was because I felt like, oh, I felt like now I finally found myself a home with a, a manager that understands me more like a like a father. Or you know, so or I have to just impress, or just the fact that he was the way he was, and I had to repay him back. So that's why I was doing the things. But I was enjoying who I was. I had my smile back. I had my sweat. You know, I was just I was in my element playing for him, and I think it was twelve. I think 13 goals in 10 games or 9 games that we play and then we jump from being 6 to literally just last game losing out on winning the league because Benfica won the league and Porto finished second from being nowhere near even going to be able to finish fourth and then when Mourinho came we won every single remaining um, 9 games left and I, I bagged 13 goals, and I think I scored two hat tricks in that. So, so it, it was. And he'd said to you, didn't he? We we will we'll win the league, which okay, but then next year we'll win the UEFA Cup if we don't win the league, and yes. then we'll win the. So then, so then the fact that now Celta Vigo called me back, that was the that was the sickening part that they didn't want me because now all of a sudden things are changing. Now they want me to come back to be a second choice striker, and I tried to fight them. I tried to fight them about it, but yeah, Porto couldn't pay the money that Celta wanted. Celta wanted 10 million euros, 
and now Porto was only willing to pay seven million, and the two teams couldn't get to an agreement, and then I had to return. But he texts me every game when Porto play. He texts me and says, "Ah, I wish you were at my side now, but you know we're okay. We're gonna be pushing, and next year we're gonna be pushed for Champions League, and I'm definitely coming to get you because for the money that that the club's gonna make." from winning the Europa League and that, then he's got enough money. He just wants one signing and I want you, you my player. Wow. So he put a lot of confidence and I think that sort of kept me going for that season that I went back to Celta and, you know, I was training. Ah, I'm training at 150% level. Not for Celta, I'm going to Porto <laughs> next season. So then, yeah, and then Mourinho phoned me and says, ah, listen, Benny, done, we've got the money that Celta wants, so that's my priority, and I want you here, and hope you're ready, and you know. So, so I went. Now, people know more about Carvalho, but I'm going to ask you a question, because I've met him a few times. Like, he was a very... Str- he was almost like an Italian defender because with Carvalho, if he didn't win, you beat you through the football. There were no rules. He, could do, he did anything to win. But he's quite... A, he seems quite a quiet, timid guy when you speak to him, right or wrong? A soft yeah. giant, you know? But I think his career was saved because he had a manager like Jose Mourinho. Because he understood his players, he got to know the players, pers- personalities and that. And that's why wherever Jose went, he tried to get Carvalho, because he knows he's going to drown if he plays for another manager. The worst player that you could ever have in your team from Monday to Friday hmm. in trainings. Like the worst trainer ever! Wow. The worst trainer, Monday comes, Ricky, Ricky, Ricardo, go home. No then way. he'll send him home. Not doing his job, not doing his job, but Mourinho knew. Come Saturday, he's playing. Man of the match, Ricardo Carvalho. People who value sleep sleep on a nectar mattress. But you're not going to believe me. After all, I might be lying. I must be lying. The only thing you know is true is that commercials lie to you. I must be lying. Instead of believing silly commercials, trust the more than 2 million happy sleepers who sleep on a nectar mattress. Nectar Sleep is currently running their biggest offer ever, $399 in accessories plus a 365-night home trial and free shipping and returns. Go to Nectarsleep.com today. Want the high-stakes stuff? The believe-the-hype stuff? The criminally good, emotional roller coaster, can't believe what you're seeing stuff? You know, the good stuff. AMC Plus has it all. Can't wait for the beginning of the end? Watch all new episodes of The Walking Dead one week early. Want to be chilled to the core? Set sail with the North Water, a thrilling Arctic drama starring Jack O'Connell and Colin Farrell. Plus, uncover gripping true crime content ad-free and on demand. Expect the epic with AMC Plus. Sign up today at amcplus.com. AMC Plus. Only the good stuff. We're nearly out. Sadly, before he died, the prince phoned me and said, Is it true that Martin Compson knows <laughs> Greg, <laughs> Gary Tank Commander, <laughs> Nick Hugh? Um, yeah. d- d- is Gary, d- Gary's a bright. Leading man, writer, Greg, perform, yeah, yeah, get yeah, yeah, Gary yeah, yeah, to everybody yeah, yeah, else, yeah, yeah. Greg to us. Is he the kind of guy who might lead you astray? I think we lead each other astray uh-huh. quite a lot. We, um, he's a great friend of mine. I say a very, very talented boy, you know, very. with fresh meat and he's doing the A word now and stuff. But yeah, we sort of coax each other on, you know, we've ended up in some, some heaps together. Is there an example? Well, <laughs> Well, one of the great, again, one of the great <laughs> things about this, this job is I got to play in uh, the soccer thing at Old Trafford, which was just an unbelievable experience. I, I believe Kevin Bridges uh, touched on it on his, you know, and me and Kevin had a great time, you know, sitting with Mourinho and stuff. And um, well, basically, I, I played, I played a charity game, and I, and I'd done my ligaments, and I'd, I'd, I'd keyhole on it, 
and I kind of thought that was it and it took me out of work for three months so my agents and said said right enough's enough sort of like it's time to concentrate on the on, on your actual job and then the call came through for Soccer Aid and I hadn't even run or anything on it yet and I was just thinking maybe this isn't the right thing but I says I'll go down and I'll have a run and if I can wait on it I can't miss this opportunity because they told me Mourinho was was managing you were going to be playing with Seedorf, Stam, Davids, Del Piero, Shevchenko. You know, it was an incredible lineup, Van der Sar. And I thought, I just need to kind of, uh, just to be on a pitch with these people. And Mourinho was unbelievable. So we turned up on the night and I had a run about with the physio that day. And he said, look, it's weak, but it's, we can do stuff for you and it'll be, uh, it'll be all right. We'll strap you up and all that kind of thing. So Mourinho comes down for the initial kind of dinner thing. And he had the dossier on every one of us. <laughs> and he says, look, I know about your knee. He says, you're going to start at the weekend. Because you know, the point was we were to train Tuesday to Friday and play the game on Sunday. And you were sort of to play yourself into his plans. And he said, you're going to start, don't don't train. Like, we need you. And a bit of, a bit of me was like, you know, be, having been a footballer, I wanted to be on a training pitch. Yeah. Where he knew yeah, yeah. see the secrets and all that kind of thing. And so... He kind of let me kind of pot about. He'd always kind of have me on and go, right, this is where you're going to be, front post, back post. Every, he's so organised, it was unbelievable. Like, everybody knew where they had to be. And it was just mind-blowing to see this. And the first thing he said is, look, this is for charity. We're going to enjoy ourselves, but we're here to win. My teams don't lose. Right, so we got the Tuesday, Wednesday, the Thursday, he'd let me have a little kick about. He says, right, tomorrow, he says, I'm going to let you train on the Friday. So I was buzzing. So I was trying to get an early night. And then the phone goes and it's Greg. He says, look, you're going to come out. Uh, you want to come in town and meet me? I'm out with uh, Paolo Nadini, who's another, who's another good friend. And he says, no, look, mate, I've been on the, on the table all day, getting my massage and stuff. He says, the guy says, my, my knee's fine. Uh, I'm going to train tomorrow. And he said, look, just come into town. I'm like, no, no, no. He says, look, just come into town. Hug up, phone goes again. He says, look, just come meet us for a beard. You're all right. I said, look, mate, we're on lockdown. I'm playing this game on Sunday. Oh. And he said, um, he says, look, just move. And I went, no. Phone goes again, it's Paolo. And he says, if you don't come out tonight, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. And I went, look, are you, you take the piss here. Because I said, look, I really shouldn't be doing this. So do you mean that? And he says, ah, just come down, you'll see what I mean. So I, I got out the back of the hotel and jumped a taxi. You know, all the England boys were already out, but I think they were about to hang, but Mourinho was kind of strict on us. Rightly so, I think. And so I got a car into the Groucho where we're sitting now, meet Greg and Paolo for a drink. And he says, look, just follow me. We walk round the corner, just round the corner there. I think it's the back of the happen drum. I walk into this tiny wee booth and out struts Prince. <laughs> <laughs> and proceeded to play for the next five hours or so solid. No. That was unbelievable. And obviously, you know who Prince is and you know some of the songs and stuff, but I've never seen anything like it. And there must have been about 100 people in the place. Whoa. And then so I got on about 7 or 8 in the morning. Hosey, Hosey gave me the shout on the pitch. And I went, no, I think you're right, Hosey. I'm back on the table. We twins. <laughs> we twins. I felt my knee a bit heavy and I don't want to risk it for Sunday. So I just sat and lay in the bed for the rest of the day again. What did you tell him? I told, I told him after that. I told him on the Sunday night. But I didn't want to jeopardise because... I think I was supposed to start left mid. Michael Sheen broke his wrist and Michael was supposed to start right back and he said, look, I'm going to need to move you to right back. So, But I've got a great picture because of that because he said, look, I'm going to move you to right back so Michael's going to start and then we'll put you on. He's going to change the, the banners, whatever, and then you'll go on. And I've got a great picture framed of me at Old Trafford with, with Jose telling me at the side <laughs> of the pitch point and where to go. And then he said to me, uh, Ollie Murs was one, he said, just make sure, he says, that boy's a whip it. He said, just make sure he doesn't get on the ball or do anything. And as he ran by, Jose just ran on the pitch and, and nailed him. <laughs> <laughs> just nailed him. And I just seen Wee Murs rolling around looking up at me and I'm laughing. <laughs> and, and then that well, set the tone for me, so I just nailed him the rest of the night. <laughs> but it was, I mean, I mean, that kind of stuff was was unbelievable. And and to get a, a thing of being on the pitch with those players and... What I'll never forget is maybe he's un- to say he's underrated isn't the right word because he's won the European Cup with three different teams. Mm. But Seedorf controlled the tempo of mm. that entire game. I mean, you've got world class players around him, all legends. But he controlled that game when he wanted to up it the whole game up to him, when he wanted to slow it down. I think he scored three that night, actually. It was unbelievable. He, he remains a really good athlete as well. Yeah, I mean, he's he, a the, machine. The in his... Yeah, well, I mean, with the, the, him and Davids were, were whipping the bodies out in the showers. Me and Kevin were, made ourselves quite scarce. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's going to stay up there. Oh, that, uh, top, top, top. That, uh, Every so young that, fella's dream. I played Larson through for the past. That's the stuff that stays with you because that's the stuff I grew up watching, you know. I mean, I always loved acting. I always loved movies and stuff. 
But you know, I didn't dream about winning Oscars. I dreamed about lifting the cup with Celtic. I was 18, I think, when he came. For me, it was an absolute game changer because I've gone through pre-seasons where you run the first two weeks, you don't see the ball, um, you just trying to be as fit as you can, blah, blah, all the, you know, you would have heard all that nonsense. So when he came in, it was a complete game changer. It was not it opened it all up, you know, it was specific training, uh, not wasting any any time in training. The times he, when we didn't train, he, he said, if you don't want to train properly, just go in, we start again. And he wouldn't hold it against you. But he, his sort of belief was, when we train, I want you to get something out of it. and I need you to get something out of it because the end goal is the, is the Premier League, the winner of the Premier League. So we can't waste time with shit training sessions or sort of um, bad attitude or you're just going through the emotions. That wasn't, that wasn't allowed. But for the players at the time, I think the players that were a little bit older than me, they got to the point where this is shit. There's got to be a better sort of method, preparation. And when he came in, I mean, their eyes just lit up. They went, what? We, we, you know, they really, and you could see for the first, you know, three, four years, they were miles ahead. You know, I, obviously it's difficult for me to say how other teams trained and prepared, but, you know, just for defenders' point of view, like we had, we got given sheets on a, on a, on the, um, on the training seat with information about the players. Like I love that. Uh, you know, that was like, well, that's that's the level of intensity and level of preparation you need to to have success in sport. And he, Mourinho, obviously took it to a new level. You know, with, with with training, it was it was always time. There was there was no wasting. We had ball boys for training, yeah, and that was oh, we now 2004. It was, you know, normally when you do any sort of training, there was you know lots of time was wasted. People take a breather, the ball's over there, everybody goes, oh. whereas if the ball's in play all the time, you're always thinking you're always sharp. Yeah. Yeah, the, so the, that wasn't time. There was no wasted time going from different exercises. We the, the, the pitches were prepared, so you finish your position training and then the drinks were positioned. So on the way over to the other side of the pitch, you grab a drink and you sort of recover while you walk across to the different exercises. And that, that that never happened in my sort of early part of professional playing. It was just like, well, let's hang about here for five minutes while the coaches set up another drill and you lose the momentum, you lose the intensity, intensity. But yeah, I mean, yeah, he really opened it up and he sort of um, made me realise, I mean, I was always hard working anyway, but um, he made me realise what it really takes to be to be on it. Um, and I'm glad I, I got it when I was 18 because that's sort of, level of preparation that sort of took took throughout my life really and still still to this day I think when you're near anybody in any professional arena that's got such intensity preparation has clearly thought about your role other people's role you watch it and first of all your respect meter goes up a little bit you feel more engaged but on a separate level um, I, I don't think he's replicated this throughout his career but you encountered a man there who was very messianic. He, he had something about his, his devilishness, his, his wit, his, his, the, the stuff that uh, Duffer told us about flying back from, um, I, I don't know if you were on this flight, flying back from whatever, a game to, to win in, in Russia and qualifying through the group. And Mourinho saying to every, they were like, boss, boss, who do you want? He went, Barcelona, I want Barcelona. He's like, yeah, yeah, we'll beat them. We'll beat them, we'll beat them. Draws Barcelona, knocks them out. Little things like that that you encounter on a daily basis. At that stage in his career, he was messianic. He kind of oozed uh, cleverness and confidence and a sort of elan, a, a, a sort of, he stood apart, not special ones yet, but he was a different kind of guy. Is that the guy you encountered and worked for? Yeah, and I mean, as much as um, as we give him credit for for his methods, but he was, or oh, he is very intelligent. You know, like when you when you lead a, a group of men, or a, a, I'm only I can only talk for men because that's my game. But you know, it's you playing games. Like it, it, had he had said, "Oh, we want the shittiest team," the, the, the mindset of the team would have been different. So he, even if he doesn't believe it. <laughs> You know, that, yeah, that they yeah. could beat Barcelona or they could beat Real Madrid. 
when you speak to the group or individuals, you, you just make make it up, even if you don't believe it. And then next thing you hear, yeah, we, yeah, we can be Barcelona. His attitude just goes for the group, and he he wasn't allowed to have any sort of down moments or even when we lose, you know, it was always a fluke, you know, <laughs> or the ref was shit, or you know, it was never. It was always stuff. Well, we only lost because not because of us, you know, it was a that mindset, you know, the constantly driven and just confidence. My the same with my children when they're a bit down, you know, it's always a bit you, you just give them positivity, you know, believe in them when they have a big exam for schools or something. It's it's very similar to that and that's exactly what he did. Thank you for listening to the big interview. It's produced by me, which sounds egotistical, but it's also true, Graham Hunter, and Backpage. Our music is by Beer Jacket, who else? Editing by Charlie McGarry. Thank you to our hosts at Acast and our loyal sponsors at Bet365. We're also supported by our socios. Find out how to become a socio, how to support us at patreon.com forward slash Graham Hunter. Here endeth the lesson.